Hi, John. Hey, how's it going? How's was well. How are you? Not too bad. Feels good to be live. Uh, yes, versus not live, which, well, I don't know what that would feel like. I haven't been that before. Have you? Uh, any it's, with that? It, uh, no, it's an uncertainty I'm willing to live with. <laughs> well, that's good, because that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. So, John, one of my best friends in the whole world. And if you would take a moment to just introduce yourself here to all of our wonderful guests who are listening in tonight to the weekly webinar that No CD provides on obsessive compulsive disorder, we would love to uh, get to know you a little bit. That's great. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me, Patrick. It's a real, uh, real honor to be in your company. And um, my name is John Hirschfield. Uh, I am a psychotherapist. I specialize in OCD and related disorders. I'm the director of the OCD and Anxiety Center of Greater Baltimore in Hunt Valley, Maryland. And um, I have an affinity for cognitive behavioral therapy and I might, some people have called me a mindfulness enthusiast. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, it's uh, that's uh, that's me. That's me in a nutshell. Well, it's a big nutshell, John. So very good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I work out. Yeah. <laughs> so, John, um, you know, it's been interesting now coming over to NoCD. We've known each other for, geez, over a decade now. And, um, of course, have done the greatest talk ever known to mankind at the right. International OCD Foundation. Moral scrupulosity all the way. Moral scrupulosity talk. Sure. We could, we could give 20 disclaimers right now, but we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> we'll move along. Uh, but I thought it would be interesting tonight to have you on just because uh, not not just for COVID issues, but more than more than that is this this notion of response prevention, you know, the the elimination of safety behaviors. And sometimes I hear uh, therapists talk about exposure therapy. And I've been even in training therapists now trying to really get people to think in the full term exposure and response prevention that and that notion that exposure without response prevention isn't really helpful whatsoever, right? That we really need that. And I'm just interested on your take on your way to help motivate people uh, or explain to people really the necessity of utilizing the response prevention piece of exposure and response prevention. Absolutely. Uh, as you alluded to, you know, I would say not only is exposure without response prevention unhelpful, but it can be harmful to the therapeutic process. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reason why people get confused about it is they tend to think of it has to do with the language. You know, response prevention sounds like doing nothing. You know, it sounds like uh, holding your breath and clenching your fist and then waiting for something. I'm preventing a response. I'm trying not to respond. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it's actually much more active than that. What we're doing with exposure and response prevention is we're saying, hey, let's get in the ring with the OCD. Let's get into that space where the uncertainty of what you've been obsessing about is real for you. And the drive to do compulsions is real for you. And then let's pair that with making a different choice, a non-compulsive choice. And the reason we want to do that is we want to send the signal back to the brain that uh, its calculation on your inability to tolerate this situation is inaccurate. It needs to be recalculated. When people are doing exposures, but they're not doing response prevention, um, for example, maybe they're uh, testing themselves by looking at some triggering material online, but while they're doing it, they're telling themselves like, "Oh, good, this you know, this still scares me, so it means I don't want to do it." Um, they're sending that signal back to the brain that this really is a threat, you know, that they're they're responding to it the way a person would if it were a threat. You want to respond to it as if it weren't a threat, like, "Oh, this is very scary indeed." Yes, and just like sort of be there with that fear, in the same way that someone who really understands that a monster is not going to jump out of the TV and kill them when they're watching a scary movie allows themselves to be dysregulated, to be afraid yeah. and doesn't run away from the TV yeah. screen. So we want to change the signaling to the brain. We want to say basically, Hey, we understand that the brain doesn't have any, uh, opinion about all this. It assumes everything you do is rational. If you wash your hands, it assumes that they were dirty. If you avoid something, it assumes the thing you're avoiding was scary, right? So if you don't wash your hands, it assumes that they must be clean somehow. Even if there's something visible on them, that's how the brain kind of calculates its position. So we're just changing the signaling. And 
a lot of times, and I know you must, you've certainly had this experience. People will come to you and say, I've tried exposure therapy and it doesn't work. And when you ask, you know, sort of dig a little bit deeper, you realize what they've been doing is testing. They've right. been setting up these tests and either passing them or failing them and trying to make themselves feel better. But the problem is, you know, who needs to feel better? Someone who has a good reason for feeling bad. Yeah. What we want is for that person to be better at feeling that thing so that it doesn't get in the way of, uh, committing to whatever behavioral choices they want, may want to engage in, whatever's connected to their values. Yeah. And it, it's always interesting. There's, there's a lot of themes that pop up on the questions that come up here every week. Uh, those themes are typically around the lines of, why do I have this fear? Why couldn't it be any other fear but this fear, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, my response is, well, because your OCD doesn't care about those other things, or, or you yourself don't care about those other things. Those things just aren't important to you. But the one that OCD picked is the one that you had a twinge to when when that idea came into your head. It's like, oh, and OCD is like, oh, we got one. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, what, it's exactly. It's, it's what works. Yeah. Um, I often tell people it's, it, it, it is often the thing you care about the most, you know, and, and you can kind of tell when something's an obsession because it's at the top of the pyramid. When you, when you think of, well, there's one thing that has to be right. And then the rest of my life falls into place. Well, that thing is almost certainly going to be an obsession because that's not really how life works. There's never just one thing. Um, but, but that idea of um, really just saying, well, you know, you're conditioned to respond in this way. Right. So it doesn't even matter what the content is. It's like you said, uh, you had a response to something that sent the signal to your brain that that thing was a big deal. Then the next time you saw it, it felt like a big deal. So you did that response again. And you taught the brain to believe what it is you feel right now, even though you, the individual, the uh, d may not really believe it, but it feels real to you. Right? Well, I like what you said, that it's the one thing. And, and you know, I've often seen OCD will tell you it is one thing. What it doesn't tell you is the parentheses. There just happens to be a million more one things that you <laughs> yeah, all exactly. have to do too, right? So yeah. so yeah, it's one thing. And that's it. It's just one thing. And oh, good. You did that one? Good. Now that's just one more thing. And then yes. it's, there's, there's never going to be a point in your life with OCD if you keep giving into OCD that you will have satisfied all of the one things. It's, it's not possible. Absolutely. And I, and I think the other thing that's really worth mentioning uh, about response prevention is that this is the realm of mental rituals that people really need to understand if they want to get better. Um, because it's, it's your, it's the entirety of your response. It's not just, did I, did I sit there and put up with it? Or did I choose not to wash my hands? It's what was I telling myself while I was in that space of uncertainty? So if you're engaging in mental rituals and you're reassuring yourself or you're analyzing it or you're rationalizing why it's okay to engage in this exposure, you're still washing your mind in the way a person would be washing their hands. And a lot of people miss that. So response prevention is a very active thing. You have to be paying very close attention to what you're doing uh, so that you can, can change the behavior, but not just the physical behavior. It's, it's the whole response, not just what you physically do. Yeah, those mental behaviors are absolutely just as important as the physical behaviors as a as something we need to target in our treatment of OCD. Sure, and and I think a lot of therapists maybe miss that too, or a lot of patients maybe don't know that that's part of OCD as well. They're conditioned to believe that OCD is what you see in movies and what you hear jokes about on TV or something like that. So if it's an urge or an image, they don't maybe assume that that's part of OCD. And if you have a therapist who's not as familiar with that, that is something totally different to them. So uh, I was talking to someone today who said, well, I don't have OCD. You know, I look at my desk, it's a mess. You know, and, and that was the assumption of it. Right. And it was like, well, how about these other things? Oh, that's OCD. I, I, I didn't know that. Well, yeah. So we're still out educating a lot too, which is good. And, you know, for those of you who are watching tonight, no CD sponsoring this webinar. And if you're looking for a therapist for obsessive compulsive disorder, we have therapists in over 20 states right now. And uh, we are very soon accepting insurance as well, too, so across those states, too. So we're really excited to see our network growing. You can uh, go up to the corner up there in the little yellow area. There's a blue HTTPS. Hit that and you can go and get linked to our care team and they can work on getting you a free 15 minute call with them to see if a diagnostic with the NoCD team might be helpful. 
So, John, since I've been answering these questions all by myself for the last few weeks, <laughs> uh, it's kind of fun to have someone else. And uh, maybe we take a look at a few of these as well, too, if that's okay with you. So. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> all right, so let's look at this one. How does ERP work for religious OCD? It can be hard because religion is rather abstract and often compulsions are mental. Yes, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I like I like that that question. It comes up a lot, especially when um, when talking about, and we don't have to get into too much the technicalities here. But when talking about inhibit, inhibitory learning and how part of that is that you're you know violating the expectation, you're going into a situation thinking something bad's going to happen, and then the bad thing doesn't happen, and now you've learned, okay, so maybe I miscalculated, uh, maybe I'm safe, or I'm like sort of safe enough. I don't really know where I can tolerate it, you know. But uh, people who struggle with religious obsessions are often concerned about, um, you know, events that uh, you could take place after they die, for example. Uh, and this is also true of people with uh, health anxiety. They might be concerned about, yeah, but maybe I'll get cancer in 20 years or something like that. Right, right. So it's important to know what uncertainty you're targeting when you're doing exposure therapy. And in a case like that, you're really targeting the uncertainty of whether or not you can tolerate the uncertainty itself in this moment in your life. You think, oh, I can't do this. You know, I can't read this book because it's going to trigger my religious obsessions, or I can't go to this place, uh, you know, because it triggers my religious obsessions, or I can't sit with this thought and not ask for reassurance or forgiveness from God or pray. And that's the ex uh, expectation that you're trying to violate when you do exposure therapy. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, heaven, hell, et cetera, et cetera. You don't know. I don't know. But I do know that you're looking at it from the perspective of, I can't tolerate this uncertainty in this moment and live according to my values. And I think that, that we can challenge that. You actually can tolerate the uncertainty and live according to your values. Sure. Well, even and, without knowing what's gonna sure. happen next. And, and I always like to point out to people how much uncertainty they live with on a daily basis and don't care about. Like every time I get in my car, I have no guarantee that I will make it to where I'm going without being killed in a car accident. But I'm fine with that, right? That. Yeah. That is an uncertainty that I accept. Uh, there's So there's tons of uncertainties we accept every day, but then OCD will pick one and say, well, all those other uncertainties are absolutely fine, but this one, this one is not. We have to treat this one amazingly differently than all the other ones, because this one is so much more important maybe than all the other ones are too. Yeah, and it goes to the heart of what is an obsession? What, may, what why, why do we call some thoughts just thoughts and other thoughts obsessions? And the answer is an obsession is something you don't accept uncertainty about. So you know when you go in a car that there's some chance uh, that's disturbingly not that low that you could be harmed or harm somebody else, but you accept that uncertainty because you want to go from point A to, to point B and it's too far to walk and you're just kind of used to it. And so far, most of the time, bad things haven't happened. And so you just kind of accept it. It's not like you don't care if you live or die. You're just willing to make space for that possibility in that context. And if you weren't, then you wouldn't drive. And we would absolutely say, oh, he has an obsession with tying in a car accident. Yeah. Right? That That's absolutely. really the only difference is you're just not accepting that uncertainty as if you had a choice. That's the problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, I also sometimes in these types of situations like to present an interesting kind of mind screw to patients with the notion that if if my OCD is telling me that I have to be perfect in order for God to like me, but I happen to follow a religion that says only God is perfect, then my OCD has told me I must be God, and therefore only God likes God, and everyone else has failed in the afterlife because the only acceptable person to God is God because no one else is perfect. So, you know, and, and ouch, <laughs> you're yeah, giving me I, a headache. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like to throw into that mix. Uh, also, perfectionism is a kind of sin, isn't it? Yeah, I think right. it is. Yeah. You know. Well, because if, if you try to be perfect and then you're trying to be like God, I believe there's a commandment, at least for several religions, that says, I am the only God. You shall not have a strange God before me. Trying to make yourself a God would be making yourself a strange God before the God that you're worshiping and trying to be perfect for, who is the only perfect being that you're trying to be like. <laughs> so. and, 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 and in practical terms, uh, you shouldn't try to do something that can't be done. Right. That's what <laughs> right. a waste of time that is, right? Exactly. Right. And, and, and that waste is uh, also kind of a sin, right? Because, you yeah. know, you've got this one life, you should probably cherish it, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, what advice do we have for someone too scared to do ERP in case their fears come true and they act out? Oh, a favorite of mine. Um, yeah. 
I mean, I can jump on this one first. Uh, yeah, why don't you start with it? I'll, I'll explain yeah. to you why you're right, and, <laughs> and then I'll take credit for it. Well, thank you, John. I, this is why I love you so. Um, <laughs> you know, so here's the thing. OCD will try to scare you out of doing any ERP possible because OCD is smart enough to know that ERP is the thing that challenges OCD and can lead OCD to kind of start to decrease over time. So OCD will keep telling you, yeah, but if you do that, you might actually break, you know, act out or do something horrible. And it throws out the proverbial what if kind of experience to everyone too, which it knows scares the bejesus bells out of you and which is why you don't potentially do something. So uh, the, the only way to test this, of course, would be to actually test something out and to see what would actually happen. And the goal of therapy is, again, as John said earlier, and I love what you were saying with this, is the ad uncertainty principle comes in here again too. You have to accept the uncertainty that are you willing to see if you might act out or not? But this is also from ERP standpoint, why we start with lower level stuff and we kind of work our way up. You know, we're not throwing you in the deep end of the pool, we're putting a, a toe in the water. So if somebody says, has say, has a fear of harming someone, I don't, you know, take them uh, out to the street and tell them to push me into traffic right off the bat. Although I have no problem with doing something like that. And I've done that exposure numerous times with people, but I might start first with, I'm going to have you sit in the room with me while you hold the scissors in your hand. And I want you to think about stabbing me with the scissors. And we'll start from there and we'll kind of build our way up so that the person builds confidence over time that they do have more ability to be able to handle those thoughts than they ever gave themselves credit for. I was uh, doing a knife exposure with someone, and and I'll always remember this. They were holding the knife, and I was I was holding the uh, blade end to to my wrist, and I was I was saying, you know, I'm just encouraging them and saying, yeah, it's really scary, and you're doing a good job, and just let's just stick with it. And you know, they were visibly afraid, very uncomfortable, and then they just look at me and they say, "This is not going to end well." <laughs> 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 and of course it did and it was it was a really good moment uh but but that it, it it is amazing how entrenched we can become in in this belief that how scary something is provides us with some amount of information about how likely something is and it's right. simply not true yeah. and and i think a lot of times people get confused about fear and exposure therapy and this idea that the goal is to stop being afraid or or more to the point that the thoughts themselves are irrational, right? I might stab someone. You say, oh, that's an irrational thought. Actually, the thought is just a thought. It's neither rational or irrational. Yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the behavior that we say like, well, there's a rational way to respond to a thought, I might stab someone. And there is a less rational or varying degrees of rational, rational and irrational responses to I might stab someone. So a rational response to I might stab someone is, Oh, that's very disturbing. Oh, I don't like that very much at all. Well, all right. Uh, what was for dinner, right? That seems like a pretty rational way to respond to a thought. Um, and and a less rational way might be uh, to put all of your sharp objects into a lockbox and to give it to a friend and have them bury it in the ground or something like that, right? To just make sure, you know, that the thought's not going to come true. The thought is not really the offending agent there. It's the response that's the problem. So a lot of times people get confused by this and they think, well, I have to do something about being afraid. Really, you have to do something about how you're choosing to respond behaviorally to the thought. Most of the thoughts that people come to us and, 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 and tell us are, are upsetting to them are fundamentally upsetting. If you looked at them on paper, nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants to die in a car accident. No one wants to be responsible for a crime. No one wants to wake up and realize that they've done something you know, morally reprehensible or, or in conflict with their sexual identity or something like that. The problem that isn't that it's perfectly fine to not want those things to come true and to feel uncomfortable with the idea that they may come true. But how are you incorporating the fact that there's uncertainty everywhere into a life that actually allows you to function and actually allows you to pursue your values? You know, what, what, what use are you? What's your, what's your contribution essentially if all you're doing is addressing this thought when there's a whole world out there of other things for you to address. Right. Yeah. What, what makes this one thought more important than any others? And maybe that goes back to that idea. Well, because my brain tells me it's just this one thing. And if I could get this one thing in order, then everything will be fine. Which of course, again, we know is, is a lie. Right now. I, 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 I remember, Oh, oh sorry. Just, just a quick, <laughs> quick story. Just thinking about the fear of harm and, and how it comes up and how 
the frame makes the difference. I remember when my first child was born and the, and the moment, you know, that this child was first introduced to me and, and she's like, put in my hands, put in my arms and I'm looking at it for the first time. And then the very next thing that happens is the child's put on a table in front of me and a doctor hands me a pair of scissors mm-hmm. to cut the umbilical cord. And there's just this moment where time froze, maybe about a second, second and a half. And I remember thinking, everybody has to have to have this experience. <laughs> like, <laughs> everybody needs to go through this moment where you're handed a newborn baby and a pair of scissors and, and, and told, good luck out there. Like <laughs> it's like a very strange thing. You know, unfortunately it's not something that, uh, you know, I responded to uh, like, like it was a huge threat, but I had the thought of like, well, this is very peculiar. Like how many times do you find yourself in a situation where, um, the thought of, you know, what's to stop you or I could impulsively harm something or what's the worst I could do. Well, actually you do find yourself in situations like that all the time and trying to avoid situations like that. That's what sends the wrong signal to the brain. That's how obsessions develop. Yeah. Yeah. I I love the next question and and I don't know that we'll answer it, but uh, it is, I keep seeking reassurance on everything that makes my OCD and anxiety worse. Right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> very clever very clever yeah. well maybe yeah. it does maybe it doesn't right maybe it does who knows yeah, yeah maybe it does i will let you answer that at least and kind of let us know what your thoughts are about that uh let's let's play a uh, uh, question roulette here all right there we go how do you get comfortable with being uncomfortable when you have fear and contamination ocd well, uh, it, it wouldn't matter what kind of OCD you have, first of all. Uh, you could put any kind of OCD after how do you get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And to me, that anyone who knows me or has worked with me is kind of one of the mantras that you'll hear from me all the time, which is how I'm here to help you become comfortable being uncomfortable. And so what I really want for everyone to do is to think about this, this idea that if your goal is to be comfortable all the time, you're going to have a miserable life, right? Because all you're going to be doing is searching out feeling good all the time, and you're never going to be okay with neutral, which probably most of us have for most of our lives, and you won't be uncomfortable with pain too, which is the thing that makes us human. I mean, there are just going to be painful events that happen in our lives, and you're gonna have to run away or shy away from those if that's the case, if all you're going to do is try to be comfortable all the time. So a good guaranteed way to fail is to try to always be comfortable. A good way to try to live your life and to try to just be able to get through life on a day-to-day basis is to be okay with the range of experiences that happen. Will there be really bad days? Yeah, but there's going to be really good days? Sure. So hopefully they balance each other out. Some people may not have that. Some people may. But if if you're gonna to try to predict that and make that happen beforehand, the amount of time and energy and effort that you put into trying to make that happen interferes with you actually just living your life day to day and you miss out on a whole ton of stuff. I, I think people also uh, significantly underestimate how much of what they're calling being uncomfortable is really just a body state. We spend most of our time in our heads thinking that this is a problem of thoughts, this is a problem of thinking. But it's actually a problem of the whole experience, your thoughts, your feelings, and your bodily sensations. So uh, if, it, if you look at it through a mindfulness lens, you say, well, thoughts are these kind of words that are written on the screen of your mind, and you're looking at them. And you're not the author of them. You're just kind of watching them come up like, uh, like credits in a movie come up. And we think, okay, well, that's thoughts, but feelings are different. And sensations, you know, those are way different, right? And you know, I'm sure you've had lots of clients who are very upset. Though I had a you know response, a physical response. It felt like I wanted to grab the knife, or it felt like I was attracted to something I didn't yeah. want to be. But it should follow really the same rules. They're all just consciousness, right? So when you're saying you're uncomfortable, what are you really saying? You're saying there's a heaviness in your chest. There's a there's a tension uh, in your arms. There's a there's a warmth in your in your face or something like that. And those are just uh, those can be looked at simply as streams of data that are being presented to your mind. And instead of calling them uncomfortable as in they're bad and I'm judging them, I wish they would go away. They're just variations in the color of kind of what you're looking at, just like thoughts, they're coming and going. So when people struggle with being uncomfortable, I try to educate them about this idea that this comfort is an experience you're having in your body that you can watch come and go. You don't have to fix it. And if you break it down into what's actually happening at the sensory level, it's, 
it's tingling, it's pressure, and sometimes it's pain, but pain too is just one of those experiences that comes and goes like an itch if you're paying a certain kind of attention. And, and you know, I'm, obviously I'm not trying to be uh, kind of rosy eyed about it. I realize that there are chronic pain conditions and, and people who are like really struggling and you need something more than to just kind of, you know, roll with it. But a lot of what people describe as the discomfort, like I just, I have to do this compulsion or I have to get away from this, uh, this trigger it has to do with they're, they're completely locked up in their head. They're not paying attention to the fact that this is actually a body state and something that they can be present with. And if they're paying yeah. attention, it passes like everything else. You know, it's interesting too. There's, there's a lot of people who say I'd be okay with being physically uncomfortable, but I'm not okay being mentally uncomfortable as if somehow there's some differences in those and one's more acceptable than another. And mm -hmm. I always try to get people to recognize we have an amazing ability to accept physical discomfort and we can also accept a great deal of mental discomfort as well too and many of these things are passing types of things but the more that we're going to focus on it the more it's actually going to come up and the more it's at the forefront of our mind and then our threshold to find that gets lower and lower over time and it just becomes easier and easier to feel mentally uncomfortable for things that maybe a year ago didn't make you mentally uncomfortable because you're always searching for where am i mentally uncomfortable today yes indeed all right, let's take a look around here and see what else we have. Life is a roller coaster of ups and downs. Yeah, well, we all agree. <laughs> How do I come about HOCD and ROCD in a relationship? Um, I don't know. I also feel like a lot of my thoughts are just negative, and I feel like something is holding me back in order to be more positive. What should I do? And, well, uh, I'll just say, and John, you've done a lot of great blog posts on this too, I know. So there's there's some really good work that you've done on, on your blog through uh, through your website, which I'll have you promoting in a little while. But, uh, yeah, no but you know, how many people are, again, looking at their relationship, which they might identify to them as being the most important thing in their life. And so OCD is going to pick that thing and throw doubt in it. And it's going to throw doubt in it in terms of, is the relationship the right relationship? Do I like this person enough? Is there someone out there better for me? Or it's going to throw doubt in it with OCD. Am I actually really attracted to this person? And, and would I be a lie to them if I were with them? And what a horrible person I would be to with them if it wasn't them that I was supposed to be with? And what if it's this and what if it's that? So uh, I, I'll i throw it over to you on some of that too. But uh, Well, I think I think the first thing we, we want to be careful about is getting too wrapped up in content. I mean, it's, it's nice that we have these abbreviations so that we can communicate with each other online. So when I say I have HOCD, I, I, I presume you're going to understand that it means I have obsessions about my sexual orientation. If I say ROCD, it means I have obsessions about the quality of my relationship. But that doesn't really matter because it's not about the content, right? It's really about the process by which you're responding to thoughts about these things. And these things just happen to be your target areas because of what we were discussing before. That's what works. That's what your OCD latched onto. That's what you responded to. And, um, you know, to, to the specific question, I, I think the, the person who's asking the question commented that they also noticed they have a lot of negative thoughts. Um, I found that this HOCD, ROCD hybrid often comes with some mood difficulty, often some kind of depressive quality to it. Uh, and part of what happens when you have OCD and depression essentially tag teaming one another is your ability to find delight when delight arises, like, oh, you know, my partner smiled and it felt really good and that was really nice. I felt really attracted to them. It's suppressed. It's suppressed by the depression. And so you're kind of looking at your partner and you're like, oh, who is this person who lives in my house? You know, how did I end up here? And then, and then your OCD says, what, what, you don't feel the butterflies that you felt on your first date? Like, you know, 10 years later, that's, that's okay. horrible. You know, you know, so-and-so, you know, your neighbor is, uh, you know, madly in love with her husband every day. What, what's going on? Maybe you're not attracted to, to your partner right. because you're secretly gay. Okay? And so it becomes this game that the OCD and the depression play off of each other. And it's not just this random intrusion. You're actually not responding to things the way you normally would if you weren't depressed. And I'm not saying this person's definitely depressed, but it's something I've seen a lot. And, and what I've also seen is that when they address that in the treatment alongside the OCD and get some behavioral activation going, they become more receptive to joy 
and they, they end up being triggered a lot less. And even when they're triggered, they're able to see it much more clearly as OCD, as opposed to some serious side of a serious problem in the relationship. Hi, everyone. So just as a reminder, as we're halfway through here, this uh, webinar is brought to you by NoCD. NoCD is an online therapy tool for people across the country. You can download the NoCD app and go to treatmyocd.com. Or you can also go up in the corner here in the yellow little yellow box with the blue hyperlink and you can go on there. You can have a free 15 minute call with one of our care team and they can set you up for a diagnostic assessment with one of our therapists across the country. And we will soon be accepting insurance payments as well too. So we're excited about that. John, I think the theme so far that we've seen in all of our answers has been, it doesn't matter what type of OCD you have. It matters how you respond to the thoughts or the images or the urges that you experience. Right? Yes. Yeah, I think that, that would be fair. And I want to I want to just for a moment really emphasize too that idea of images and urges as well because many people do talk about OCD thoughts but I think it's important just to keep in mind for everybody else that OCD also is these urges that you might experience to do something or to have something done to you. And it could be images that pop into your head as well. And those are also fodder for OCD and things that might also be very distressing to individuals as well. So, And, and they're fundamentally normal events. I think that's worth yeah. pointing out too, that if you have, let's say, an urge to do something that isn't in line with your identity, it makes sense that that bothers you and you'd want to do something about it. But mm -hmm. it's really important to remember that part of being alive, part of consciousness is to also be aware of thoughts and, and images and urges that don't line up with your identity. Your identity is a story that you cultivate and that, you know, you do the best you can to try to live by that story, uh, which is, you know, uh, kind of bolstered by your underlying values. But just because you had a thought or a feeling or a sensation or an urge that doesn't line up with that identity doesn't actually mean there's a problem. That's actually how it's supposed to work, right? So yeah. I'm, a, I'm not a violent person in any way, but if I buy a knife and I, and I have this, I feel this sensation, like I have this urge to just reach for it, it's sure, I mean, naturally my brain's gonna be like, hey, what are you doing there? Calm down, right? And I might think that that's a little you know, disturbing. But the urge itself is not a sign of mental illness or something's broken in my brain. It's perfectly okay to have thoughts and urges and sensations that don't line up with your identity. It's not a right. system that's designed to cater to your story. Right. I, uh, how many times have I been cut off in traffic and had the urge to just ram my car into the car that cut me off? Well, tons of times. I, I've never done it. So am I a bad person for the urge of having that? Or am I just a human being and I experience urges and I have images that pop in my head and I have random thoughts? And why are most of the random thoughts or things that pop in my head okay? But when they're in this one category, they're absolutely not okay and they're unacceptable. And that's where OCD comes in and, and really, I'd say, screws around with people's lives. It's saying that you, you can't have it in this area. You can have it in any other area, but you can't have it in this area. That's a problem. Yeah, so. yeah and it's your personal responsibility, your mission in life to address it. Because if you were to say, well, that was odd and leave it alone, then it's, uh, you know, that that almost feels like um, you're skirting some moral responsibility to protect your identity. Right, right. So I like this one. As a family member of someone with OCD, uh, what is the least helpful thing or attitude to have and the most helpful attitude or thing to say? So as a family member, what is the least helpful attitude and what is the most helpful attitude? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think, um, the, obviously, the, I think the least helpful attitude would be one that's based on confusing the person with the disorder, right? So it's like, um, uh, you know, why, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Why, you know, why are you this way? You know, I'm so angry at you for, for doing this stuff, you know, these compulsions, stuff like that. As opposed to understanding that, okay, there's the person and they're doing the best they can and they have this disorder and it's making their life difficult. The most helpful attitude would be to... Um, to lead with some kind of uh, love and understanding, which might require some, you know, getting educated on your part first to say, like, I see that you're in pain, right? As a fellow human being, I see that you're in pain and I, and, and I lament that you're in pain. Let's start from that perspective. And then, you know, we, the, these behaviors at home, you know, that are causing us to be late and things like that. What can we do? How can we work together to address these behaviors? Not, 
how, how, you know, when are you going to change and what's wrong with you? And you know, why, why are you such a, this kind of person? So yeah. you, you make the OCD about the OCD and the person about the person. And you start from that platform of, Hey, I'm a person, you're a person. I see you're in pain. How, how can we work together? Yeah. And then I think from another angle, when we're looking at it from a treatment kind of point of view would be the worst things that family members could do, of course, would be to undermine the therapy by providing yes. All sorts of reassurance and accommodation, accommodations and distraction, yeah. co-ritualizing. Uh, yeah, exactly, co-ritualizing. So I'll I'll wash my hands in front of you to your specifications so that I can make dinner for all of us. That kind of thing. And so even though uh, it it may feel like if I don't do this, chaos is going to ensue in our family. There, there does have to come a point where we decide that we're not going to let OCD run the family anymore. Uh, I had a patient, John, and this was, I loved how he described it to me a couple of weeks ago. He said, I feel like I'm in Stockholm syndrome, that I've been captured by this awful, horrible kidnapper who treats me like crap. And yet I do everything that I possibly can to satisfy them at all times. Yeah. And, and I thought just what a, what a great description that was and how, you know, OCD does not care at all about the rest of the family. It doesn't care if they're happy or sad or angry or mad about anything. OCD just wants to be satisfied at all times. I mean, it is a it is a child throwing a tantrum in the middle of the mall and doesn't care if anyone else notices. It wants what it wants and that's what it wants. So if if we look at it that way, hopefully we can recognize that we can separate out who our family member is from who their OCD is. And so if your family member is just mad at you and calling you names and saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to beat you or I'm going to kill myself, that you kind of pull away and recognize that's the OCD throwing out every threat that it knows to throw out so that I will give in to it so that it will be satisfied. And they're going to have to come a point where families decide they're not going to do that, which might even mean then if the person then uses the fight, flight or freeze response and does fight or that you call the police. If they threaten to harm themselves, you get 911 involved. But you have to come to a point where you say OCD is no longer going to be in control of our household. And everybody in the family system ends up having, it, when it works well, everybody has to do exposure and response prevention. And so yeah. for the family member who's, who's watching their loved one with OCD struggle and, and they know all they have to do is say the reassuring words or, or, you know, provide them with more soap or whatever it is to help them finish the ritual so that their immediate pain is reduced. And then a family member now understands like, okay, that's actually feeding the beast. That's feeding the OCD. It's making the problem worse. So now I have to not do that. Okay. Well, that's a lot of discomfort for the family member to endure, to watch their loved one squirm, knowing that they could stop the pain, but remembering that the compassionate thing to do here is help this person overcome their OCD. But what if, what if I'm just being cruel? You know, what if I'm not being empathic enough or, yeah. or, or what if they, you know, what if this is too much? What if this is the exposure? Uh, you know, what if this is the one time I'm supposed to accommodate? Right. And so family members have to also learn how to tolerate that uncertainty and model their ability to do exposure and response prevention for their loved one. And mm -hmm. that's when things work the best, when everybody's willing to say, yes, this is uncomfortable, but I understand why, exposing to the discomfort and sitting with it and working through it is better than trying to appease the OCD that's never going to end. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. All right. This is an interesting one. And and it brings up some ideas of therapy that I think are really interesting too. So the question is, I've been having obsessive thoughts about bodily sensations. For example, today, I think I'm going to throw up. I may not be able to stop and I will never be able to eat again. And I, I like uh, what our friends in the panic world uh, and have done with the idea of interoceptive exposure. And I'm a big fan, uh, I don't know about you, John, but I'm a big fan of including interoceptive exposures in obsessive compulsive disorder work. And for those of you out there who aren't familiar with this concept, an interoceptive exposure is an exposure to a bodily sensation. So running in place or hyperventilating, breathing through a straw, spinning in a chair, all to create uncomfortable physical sensations because there may be a specific obsession about an actual physical sensation or 
there could be a threat of if I don't do the compulsion, I'll have a panic attack. And that would be even more awful or horrible if I had that. So I have to do the compulsion to stop the panic attack. So there's like a reciprocal relationship in there. So John, I don't know about you, but I've started to make sure that people start to practice some interoceptive exposures in their work as well too. Yeah, well, I want the whole experience, right? It's right. not just about the thoughts. It's like I was saying before, a lot of what's going on is you're trying to get away from bodily sensations. You're saying you're anxious, you're uncomfortable, you're tense, and, and it's the thoughts that's causing them, but the thoughts are not the only part of that equation. So the more you can create whatever it is that OCD says means you have to do compulsions, the better the exposure, right? We want to get the full experience so that the only thing that keeps the compulsion from happening is that it didn't happen, right? The only thing that makes the distress go away is that the distress went away, right? right. There was, yeah, and, and, and so if, there, if you understand that uh, part of your fear is the thought, that we do exposure to the thought, and if part of the fear is the emotion, like maybe you're afraid um, that you're going to do something because you're angry. Well, you know, let's, let's, let's go look at some like political Twitter feeds real quick and then like get you ramped up and then let's put the knife in your hand and then let's, you know, play some heavy metal music and let's get the full experience going <laughs> so yeah. that your brain can be a witness to that. And then when, when it passes, okay, some learning has taken place. And, and the biggest thing you learned is that that is a space that you can be in as, a, right. as opposed to a space that you can't be in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's the thing we want to repeat and really hardwire in, into the brain. So I love when I can working in interoceptive exposure. And so I always ask a lot of questions about, well, okay, but how does it feel right before you want to do a compulsion? Yeah. Oh, there's this, you know, there's this, uh, I feel sweaty or whatever. Great. So let's turn the heat up in the office. You know, I feel dizzy. Let's spin around for a little bit. Let's run in place, whatever it takes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And, you know, with that and kind of what we were talking about in the previous question too, uh, sometimes with that that avoidance of physical discomfort, I, I have even said to families, if if your loved one was, let's say, on a detox unit, and you went to visit them and they were sweating and shaking and throwing up and had diarrhea and they looked at you and they said, could you please just get me some vodka so I stop feeling all these awful, horrible experiences? Would you go out and do it? And everyone says no. And I say, well, okay, that's interesting. So it's okay to be physically uncomfortable now in order to be get to get better later. You know what, it might actually be okay to be emotionally uncomfortable now in order to get better later too. And so that sometimes has kicked people in a little bit to recognize why we're doing what we're doing. So. And, and a lot of times, I'm sure you've had this experience too, people will say, well, why, why should I do exposure homework? My whole life is an exposure. I'm constantly dealing with this barrage of thoughts. They're happening all day. Why would I, why would choosing to think them or choosing to expose them be yeah be the treatment for that. And, and the answer is because you're on the defense all day, right? They're happening. You, you view them as happening to you. They're these offending objects, these thoughts and these sensations, and you're trying to deal with them or trying to avoid with them or trying to put up with them. And we want to change the nature of the game. We want you to choose to engage with them, have them go, you know, bring them on on purpose, go on the offense. And then when the OCD says you can't handle it, instead of saying, uh, you kind of like tightening up and saying, you know, please don't hurt me. You just say, you know, well, maybe we'll see or bring it or, or whatever is in line with your attitude, but not being on the defense. Because if you're on the defense, you're sending the signal to your brain that you are in danger, that you're being attacked, but you're not yeah. being attacked. You're having right. thoughts, feelings, and sensations, and you can learn how to, how to be with those. And, you know, I like what you said, your, your whole life is an exposure. You're correct. But you know what? Not enough of your life is response prevention. And mm -hmm. so that's part of the reason why you continue to stay stuck in this, because you're just constantly dodging all of these exposures and you're not going head on to them with, with response prevention. And therefore, you, you keep being convinced that it's that dodge of that exposure to that thing that saved me instead of facing it head on. Okay. Uh, once again, everyone, this webinar is brought to you by NoCD. NoCD is at treatmyocd.com. You can download the NoCD app along with about 75,000 other people across the world who have downloaded the app. So that's pretty awesome. There's a great community feed on there as well that you can kind of share your story with other people and get support from others. And 
and there's great therapy tools to utilize as well. Even if you're not using no CD teletherapy, the therapy tools on there are free for you to utilize to help you in your own exposure and response prevention journey. Now, John, we have a fun question here that it was like maybe a softball was given to us by MJ MJ, but it says, please talk about moral scrupulosity, non-religious with a specific <laughs> focus on laws, morals, ethics, and rules. And, and this is where you and I have become semi-famous in, <laughs> in our talk that we give at the International OCD Foundation talking about what it's like to live in a world where there can be questionable morals or laws or ethics and how we deal with the fact that there's no 100% right or wrong on that. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I love working with moral scrupulosity because the, it's really the affliction of, of, of big thinkers. It's a very philosophical OCD. And so the, the people who tend to be stricken with it, they tend to be very intelligent, very compassionate, very interested in, in making a contribution to society but their OCD just doesn't cut them any slack, you know, and, and, and that, that pressure to make sure that you're being perfect. And it becomes a kind of, uh, a kind of health anxiety where you're constantly checking your moral health to make sure that you're not developing a moral cancer. Yeah. Um, and what's also interesting about it is that the compulsions can be very subtle and they, they often have to do with, um, things that you wouldn't normally think of as compulsions. Usually you think of compulsion as something that makes you feel better in the short run. Yeah. But uh, a lot of compulsions and especially moral scrupulosity, they make you feel bad because what you want is to feel bad because it proves that you're a good person. So compulsively clinging to and dwelling on and investing in guilt because you might have hurt somebody's feelings kind of evens the score. It, it, it eases that discomfort of uncertainty about whether or not you might be getting away with something, which would be the worst for the morally scrupulous getting away with something is, is a fate worse than death. Mm -hmm. So, so punishing yourself by just really kind of squeezing that. And so sometimes the exposure is, is a little bit different instead of like, uh, pushing people to feel bad, oh, you did a bad thing, you did really bad. Actually, sometimes what works best is pushing them to act like they're completely aloof and they're having a great time and they don't really care if somebody just, uh, you know, somebody's life is ruined because of something they said or did because, you know, hey, uh, you know, my your favorite show is on and that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe I'm becoming callous and I'm going to be like, you know, one of those narcissists that I'm afraid of, but, uh, you know, it's a party. And, and kind of doing going in that opposite direction of challenging your, yourself to confront the uncertainty about your, your immorality. Yeah. And, and interestingly, I think the purpose of it in many ways is OCD is there then to constantly be reminding you of all the things that might go wrong so that you can not do them again in the future. But then how can you really enjoy your life if all you're being reminded of constantly are all the things that could go bad or wrong or that you might do that could be offensive or harmful to somebody? And, and you just you can't smile. You can't laugh. You can't enjoy things. And so, like you said, the exposures might be to do something like that. I mean, I remember uh, taking someone over when I was working at Amita, taking someone over to the hospital. Hospital, and we took a small paper clip and we put it in the hall on the floor and we just sat over at another end of the hall and my patient was sitting there just wanting to jump up and because what if somebody slid on that paper clip fell broke their neck and they would be responsible because they put it there and it doesn't even have to be that they put it there they just happened to see it and didn't pick it up and then someone else might not have seen it and slipped on it and I could have potentially stopped somebody from being harmed by having done that I chose not to so now it's my responsibility if someone is harmed because of it and if there's a way for OCD and moral scrupulosity to link that you could be the cause of something bad happening to somebody else what a bad person you are for not having prevented that yeah yeah and the, and the territory and the reason why moral scrupulosity and religious scrupulosity are often talked about in uh, you know together uh, the territory that they actually share is this notion that um, there's, there's an amount of complete, of, of, of following the rules that you could measure, right? That, that you're supposed to somehow know how much, um, how, 
how closely you're following the rules. So you have, as if there was like a moral doctrine, here's what a good person is, here's what a bad person is. And uh, that's, that's, that you need to know like that it's somehow quantifiable. And it was interesting if you ask someone with moral scrupulosity, what, well, how good a person do you have to be? It's like, they've never heard the question before. <laughs> because like, obviously I'm supposed to be good as in the same way I'm supposed to be pious. Like this is my religion. I'm supposed to follow it. Right. As opposed to there being some flexibility. And, and, and the other similarity is, is this sense that if in religious scrupulosity, you're devoting all of your life to trying to be perfect at practicing your religion, well, then you're not really practicing your religion because you're not living your life. And right. the same thing happens in, in moral scrup. What's so moral about being completely self-absorbed and obsessed with your thoughts and your feelings and your narrative and your story and whether or not people think you're a good person when you could siphon off a huge portion of that attention to just, I don't know, say hi to somebody or shake somebody's <laughs> hand or like do something, you know, yeah. make somebody smile or something like that. There's, there's nothing moral about catering to the OCD. And yeah. it just comes down to being willing to accept uncertainty that, uh, yeah, you know, maybe given your best attempt or, or even a lazy attempt, uh, it didn't land well. You hurt someone's right. feelings, you, you, you committed a misdemeanor, you caused some distress to somebody. Um, that's okay. Yeah, and, and there's a couple of things. I mean, I think that there is, like you said, the link with religious, even though the, the moral piece might be a bit different, but I, I love looking at Old Testament concept of sin, which when you go from Aramaic to Greek is, Hamarsha, or you miss the mark versus our modern day idea of sin is you're going to hell, you know, <laughs> just, yeah. you know, yeah. you know where, where we've really taken it to what is the worst way to look at this possible? Oh yeah. Let's, let's go with that one. That's the one to go. And then that other idea that, and, and there's, I, I want to you know, think of this in, in don't sound pejorative on it, but there's almost kind of a narcissistic quality to it, if you think about it, right? Where it's like, it's fine for everyone else to be here, but I have to be here to be equal to everyone else. If I was what everybody else was, that would be horrible. I couldn't, I couldn't live with that. So I have to be here just to be equal to everyone. And, and how the, the OCD does become this idea that in order to be equal, I have to be better, right? Yes, yes. And, and I think also that um, moral scrupulosity runs across all of the themes. This is why it's important that we get away from the content as soon as we can, yeah. because uh, you could take something like uh, sexual orientation obsessions and say, well, it would be immoral for me to, uh, you know, continue to stay married to my wife if there's a chance that I might be gay. And now I have to prove that I'm not gay. Right. right. Or it would be like, you made give the example of, of the paperclip, which was, you know, kind yeah. of, it was moral scrupulosity because, you know, they didn't pick it up and someone could get hurt, but then that's also harmless, right? Because they're letting like somebody, do, somebody yeah. get harmed. Yeah. And, and so a, a, a lot of obsessions come down to this fear of moral failure because, you know, right here on earth, if people knew I wasn't moral, you know, they may reject me. And that's a kind of death that just is ongoing during life that people are really invested in avoiding. And again, learning to embrace that uncertainty doesn't say, mean anything regarding your morality. It doesn't make you a worse person because you're more flexible with your morality. It doesn't even make you a moral relativist. It just makes you a person who is more committed to living a life of your values than you are committed to being right about something. Right, right. Yeah, and and, and that's, that. I think you really see with, with this existentialist kind of piece to it that that internal suffering that people put themselves through uh, because there's there's a constant feeling of never having actually achieved anything that you feel like you're supposed to achieve because it, it's the uh, it's the concept of sisyphus right the the stone is a pound too heavy and the hill is one degree too steep for you to get the rock to the top but boy you're gonna just keep trying to get it there you're always gonna fail but OCD doesn't care that you're always going to fail. In fact, it knows you're always going to fail, but it tricks you into doing the journey anyway, because yeah. it wants you to always be doing anything in service of it at the expense of you living your life or enjoying anything else. The game is rigged. Yeah, no doubt. it really is. Well, John, 
that is bringing us toward the end. I want to give you a moment if you want to plug your website and some of where your blogs are and everything, give you a moment to be able to talk about that if you, or your books. You've got some excellent books out as well, too. So thank please. you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, the, I guess the central hub would be ocdbaltimore.com. That's, uh, that's my website. That's uh, where you can find my blogs. Um, obviously, you know, I've done my moral duty of writing several blogs about COVID since that's what we're all required to do now. <laughs> so there's some new blogs there about what's going on with the pandemic, but there's also lots of blogs about different different themes in OCD and different manifestations. Um, I can also be found on Instagram where, you know, back when things were more consistently funny, I was making a lot of memes. I haven't, I've kind of lost my meme stride a little bit since the <laughs> pandemic started, but I'll get it back one day. Uh, but that's uh, that's Instagram uh, slash OCD Baltimore. Also on Twitter, uh, at, uh, my handle is OCD Baltimore. And um, I think my Facebook is I, my Facebook is either John Hirschfield or it's OCD Baltimore. I'll, I'll let you find out because <laughs> I actually can't remember right now. Search for it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have um, a second edition of the Mindfulness Workbook for OCD comes out this December. Oh, so great. it has some uh, some new chapters in there on uh, mm -hmm. ex existential OCD and, uh, and some other kinds of OCD. I'm going to talk about inhibitory learning a little bit more in the book as well. So mm -hmm. uh, so excited about that release and uh, working on a teen workbook for OCD uh, that besides being what I hope is a useful workbook for teens with OCD has some amazing illustrations in it by Sean Shinnock, who's uh, an OCD <laughs> advocate and uh I'm really I've looking seen forward to them, and they're, they're yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah, really looking forward to people seeing that. So that'll come out the following year, I think, in the spring. Good. And you're, you know, legally you're well. No public defenders in your life or anything. Like <laughs> <that>. <laughs> oh, you got me. You got me. I know. I was looking. I was in that final stage where I'm supposed to, uh, you know, go through the 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 text line by line and, and proofread it. And I was doing this for the for the second edition of the Mindfulness Workbook, and I'm thinking, what's the point? <laughs> I went through all of that, and he's referring to a wonderful Easter egg in my book, uh, Overcoming <laughs> Harm, where myself and my publishers and several different editors and many, many people uh, missed a beautiful typo in there. Um, so I'll let you buy the book and find the typo. <laughs> I did find the other typo. I missed that one, but I found the other one. <laughs> and I am Patrick McGrath. I'm head of clinical services at NoCD. NoCD was the sponsor tonight of this webinar. NoCD is available to you at treatmyocd.com. You may download the app for NoCD on the iOS or, or uh, Android PlayStation or Play Store. Sorry. And uh, feel free to get a hold of NoCD if you're looking for a therapist somewhere across the country. We are available in 20 states now and we will be taking insurance too. Be back again next week. Wednesday. Thank you all for your questions and we will continue to work on answering all of those and helping all of you live in a way that OCD isn't taking over your life. Have a great night, everybody. John, thank you very much.